Mr. Chris, order. Mr. Chris Little has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Education. I remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary clerk. Please read the question. To ask the Minister of Education to outline the planning that has been made for schools affected by proposed industrial action by the National Association of Schoolmasters, Union of Women Teachers, NAS, UWT. I call the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, industrial action by teachers has been ongoing since 2011, and very specifically the last ballot by NAS, UWT was in 2011, voting for industrial action, and has continued uh, ever since then. The most recent escalation is linked, obviously, to the recommendation by the management side of the Teachers Negotiating uh, Committee regarding teacher pay for 2015 and 2016. The total pay deal across those two years is 2.61 per cent. The Teachers Negotiating Council is the, oh, sorry, committee is the recognised negotiating ma uh, machinery for teachers' terms and conditions, representing, as it does, on the trade union side by the Northern Ireland the NITC, which encompasses the five main teacher unions and then on management side by the main managing authorities, particularly the Education Authority and CCMS. The management side of the TNC issued a letter to boards of governors and school principals on the 17th of November 2016, which included guidance for helping schools to manage in the face of increased industrial or escalated industrial action. Now, I understand that today the management side has urged the Northern Ireland Teaching Council to suspend their industrial action and to engage with management side in urgent negotiations in order to resolve uh, the matters which have resulted in industrial action, but particularly with a focus on 2017 and beyond, because I think we need to see uh, settlements, not simply of disputes which have been ongoing for a number of years, but to see if we can actually reach a position and a realistic position as we move forward from 2017-18 for the rest of this mandate. Call Mr. Little for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Speaker's office for taking this question and for the, the Education Minister for his response. I, I regret that we're only getting this opportunity so close to scheduled uh, industrial strike action next Wednesday. Uh, and I would ask the, the Minister why he has failed to support a 1% cost of living pay increase for teachers across Northern Ireland in 2015 to 16, and what immediate action he is taking to avert industrial strike action scheduled for next Wednesday that is likely to impact schools across Belfast and beyond? Well, I'm glad to see the urgency of the member, given that I don't think he's actually been in contact with the department to seek a meeting with me on the, on the subject. Uh, Order. Uh, sorry, and with respect on that, that issue, you haven't, so uh, this may be a little bit about a degree of grandstanding than actually, uh, than actually sort of a degree of, of real interest in the, in the subject. But in terms of, in terms of the 1%, mention has been made let us be clear on this. Across the last two years, in terms of this, there was ongoing negotiations that took place. There was not a realistic approach that was taken. The initial position taken uh, in terms of the trade union pay, pay claim, including the 1.13% in terms of increments, was for a, an annual increase of 8.23%. That was what was sought by trade unions. There was then, in terms of an increment, including an increment of 3%, with no indication of uh, a removal of that increment. We are in a position, I mean, the member makes reference, consistent, and others as well, to the 1%, and particularly the issue has been raised in terms of parity with England, Scotland, and Wales. It should be noticeable, for example, in Scotland that the pay rates are actually below that in Northern Ireland, and that indeed annual increments, which means that every teacher below 37,500 will receive a pay rise for 2015 16, uh, that that has been something which, in terms of annual automatic increments were actually abolished in England a number of years ago. So if we're looking to compare, we've got to compare like with like, and therefore, for example, even the more modest claim of a while ago of a 3% pay rise in year would be three times what would be got in England in that regard. So if there's got to be parity in terms of the 1%, then that has got to be across the board within that. Now, there is no doubt I think all of us would like to see a greater degree of public sector pay for a range of workers. But we are in tight financial circumstances, and the circumstances in which, if this was simply injected into the system, and let me make it clear, I want to see negotiations and discussions, particularly 
how we can actually deal with the rest of this mandate from 2017 onwards. But the reality is that uh, if we're going to do that, there, are, there is no more additional money that's available in year. The executive does not have that money. And if, if it was to be injected into the system, the reality, given where school budgets are at present, this would simply lead to additional redundancies. And if faced with the choice between additional pay or additional redundancies, I want to keep people uh, in, in jobs, and I want to ensure that pupils are, uh, are put first by ensuring that actually teachers are kept employed. I call Sandra Overend. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for the responses. I understand that teachers are taking action over pay, workload and job security. Uh, what is the Minister doing to reduce the workload on teachers, cutting down on paperwork, um, other non-teaching duties to enable them to spend more time doing what they do best, and that is teach, and what is he doing to uh, help on job security issues? Well, on job security issues, we have a much greater level of job security issues than in England, for example, and that's where you're not comparing, where like with like is not, is not compared. Uh, there is a greater level of tenure in job security in Northern Ireland. In that sense, there are better terms and conditions in Northern Ireland than there are other parts of the United Kingdom. As regards, I, I think the member makes a very valid point in terms of the pressures that are there in terms of paperwork. That is why, as part of the pre-consultation exercise I embarked on a couple of weeks ago, I've written out to every school, not simply saying where should there be greater autonomy, but asking where there are burdens that are being put on schools by either the department or the education authority or anybody else which are unnecessary and perhaps duplicating at times work. Because I believe that, that the, if we can reduce down as much as possible um, and they remove anything that is unnecessary by way of administrative burdens, I agree with the member. I think that should be something that, that uh, is embraced. I call Barry Michael Duff. Speaker, um, can I ask the minister, in light of the fact that there have been increases to teachers' pension, contributions and to employees' national insurance contributions, as well as changes to income tax thresholds in recent years. Uh, will teachers be better off or worse off? And how does this uh, compare to other public sector workers? The issue in terms of a um, number of points have been raised, there will be a mixed bag in terms of some of the changes that have been made. So, for instance, in terms of income tax thresholds have moved, moved upwards, which means that there's a reduced level of tax on that side of things. Um, when we're looking particularly at national insurance contributions, it should also be remembered, and this is not something, this is where there's a degree of additional pressure on the executive, because it's, we always look at the headline figure in terms of where we are with the block grant. But because of changes that have been made nationally in terms of national insurance contributions by employers, there's an extra £22 million burden placed directly on schools. There's probably somewhere in the region about £40 million placed in education, but that is not unique to education. And so I know, uh, and I'm sure something that one of the members opposite will be looking at in, in the future, there's been a massive burden placed, for instance, on the health service by way of some of those changes as well. So in effect, it's not just the cut that's been there in terms of um, the issue around um, the, what's happening in education is across the board. Mentions being made in terms of other public sector workers. It should be remembered, as I, I indicated, for instance, in terms of the changes that for everyone for 16-17 will get both direct pay increase and also increment, and everyone below 37,500 below uh, for 2015-16 will see a pay rise. Now, mention has been made, for example, about the rate that was given in terms of for nurses. It should be remembered that automatic progression in teaching to the top point in terms of the upper pay scale, which is automatic, takes it up to 37,900. If you're a nurse in a similar position, your maximum rate that you come in, in increment a bit is to 28,000, and that is for a longer period of hours. Indeed, for a nurse at, at the highest level in terms of the upper pay scale compared to a teacher, uh, a teacher, their hourly rate is about 50% higher than it would be for a nurse. So whenever some comparisons at times are being made, they've got to be made within the full context of, of, of what is there. It should also be indicated that in terms of the pay rises, that is not simply also the basic pay, but it is also 1% for 1617 onto every teaching allowance that is there, whether it's a management allowance, whether indeed it is additional activities that the teacher is doing to which they're being paid. That is also being increased. Call Lord Morrow. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister, has he had any feedback from principals and chairs of governors? read the impact of the ongoing industrial actions since 2011 and what impact this has had on the children and indeed educational attainment. 
Well, look, there is a, there's obviously concerns that are out there. I think that we have seen, to be fair, despite any industrial action, I think children have achieved, and I think we've seen good results in terms of the ETI inspections and indeed in terms of some of the exam results. You know, I think the, the aim with this always should be to try to ensure that we put uh, pupils first. I think the biggest single concern that I've got raised with me consistently time and time again, both uh, before I became into office and since I came into office, is the state of school budgets. And as such, I've got to be very worried that there are a range of schools, it's been highlighted on a number of occasions, that will be moving into greater deficit problems. And I have to say, the solution to that if, they are, if schools are to live within budget, will be actually making greater levels of redundancy. So if we, we put an additional cost into the system, uh, unfortunately, because, and because the vast bulk of expenditure within schools will be on pay issues, and particularly on teacher pay, we're simply going to be forcing more people out of the profession. We will actually be uh, increasing the level of redundancies. And I think that's something we need to bear in mind as well. And that's why I believe there needs to be people need to think again and act on this realistically. I call Colin McGrath. Deputy Speaker, um, would the Minister agree with the teaching unions that the real term um, decrease to teachers' pay from 2010-2011 has been 15 per cent, and would you accept that this is having a poor impact on teaching morale, and is there anything that can be done to try and address that? No, I wouldn't agree. I mean, the indications are given about cuts to pay. Pay is actually rising, and pay has been rising in terms of, for example, in the last two years, 2.61 per cent. But I have to say, we can only, the only level of pay that can be provided, there is not some inexhaustible supply of money. And that is the same throughout the public sector. There are big pressures there in terms of that. The education budget itself is overall down this year. And from that point of view, in terms of the pressures that are there on the executive, you know, we are not in a position. And if, if people are talking about 15% pay rises, and I know at one stage, one of the unions talked about what they needed was 13% to be brought up to the parity. Those are just not realistic figures on that basis. And you know, all of us have got to, quite frankly, live in the real world. Now, I think there's got to be discussions about how we can, how we can best move forward. But if, if there are fantasy figures getting produced in terms of what should happen in terms of pay, there's got to be a realization this can only be paid for out of the budget that's there for schools, which itself can only be paid out of the budget for education and out of the block grant. And those levels of increases in terms of pay are not something that, that is realistic. And we need, instead of sometimes particularly people grandstanding on issues, we need actually to ensure that we actually deal with things on a realistic basis. Thank you. I call Kelly Armstrong. I would like to ask the Minister, what action is he taking to rationalise the administration of education in Northern Ireland to ensure that the system allows for adequate pay for teachers and resources for our schools? There has been a wide range of, of rationalisation in terms of uh, the movement on the Education Authority. There is indeed, in terms of the pressures that are there, for example, there has been a considerable level of, of voluntary exit scheme as part of that. Indeed, in terms of the bid that has been put in uh, for voluntary exit, has been greater in the Department of Education than any other department on that basis. So clearly, both within the department itself in terms of reduction of staff, within the Education Authority, and that is an on, ongoing issue within that. But given that where we are in terms of school budgets, uh, that in and of itself is not going to, to match all of the gap that is there, which is why we do need to be responsible when it comes to uh, the levels of pay. I will try and drive out whatever, drive out any additional cost that is, that is there within the system, but that is not something which can simply happen overnight. And to be fair to both my predecessor and indeed to the executive as a whole, that is something which, which has been em embraced. Um, particularly in terms of the ES, in terms of issues around investing in the teacher workforce, for instance, which have also, uh, as it moves forward, will also have some level of not only refreshing the workforce, but also leading to uh, reduction in terms of pressures on, on costs. But you know, there's going to be a limit to what ultimately people, people can get paid. And as I said, if, if increments are simply, automatic increments are simply to be um, held on to, in a circumstance in which those aren't there in other parts of the United Kingdom, then you can't also then claim there can't also be parity on, on every issue in terms of pay either. Thank you. I call Eamon McCann. Uh, I, would the Minister and members of the House not agree uh, with me that teachers do not take lightly to industrial action, but they do recognise the uh, inextricable link between teachers' pay and conditions on the one hand and the provision of first-class education for our children uh, on the other. 
Uh, they are also, is, is this not the case, uh, in this matter, defending the public service against sort of the job losses, etc., involved in the Fresh Start Agreement. They are therefore giving good example both to children and to people generally across uh, this society. In light of that, would the Minister and other members care to join myself and my comrade Jerry Carroll on the picket line with the teachers uh, next week and join with me Order. and, join, and join with me in saying that they are giving good example to the rest of them? I say that's back Mem your local teachers the and the future of question. our children. Thank you. Where uh, the member in relation to that, uh, I indicated at the start of my comments that there has been an ongoing state of industrial action since 2011. Uh, I suspect for the member that's probably been an ongoing industrial action since about 1971 in relation to that. So no, I will not be joining him. And you know, with, with respect, it is the same level of, of fantasy politics that the member uh, seems to, to propagate. You know, I at least have some sympathy for the previous questioner who said, what can we do to actually drive out unnecessary administrative costs? What can we actually do to say uh, if there are costs, and if we're talking about administrative costs, that also means ultimately in terms of ensuring that we reduce administration, which also means that in terms of voluntary redundancies and VES, we have to ensure that's the maximum. You know, if we're going to save that, to put that into education funding, I think that that is a sensible way forward. If we are going to maintain, uh, not simply, and I'm sure the member would want to see an expansion of the numbers within the public, uh, public service, and also greater, greater pay uh, for everyone within the, the public service, mathematically, that doesn't add up. I can't simply pluck figures out of the air. I can't simply add money to it. And I think that, you know, I'm possibly waiting to see the industrial action which the member and his colleague are not on the picket line. That may be the one that, uh, that's maybe the occasion whenever, whenever the member is refusing to go to picket line, maybe that's the one I should be looking to, to go on. I call Stephen Agnew. The Speaker. Minister, there will have been Barnet consequentials to the pay rise that was given to teachers in England, and whilst I appreciate that that wouldn't have been ring-fenced, um, did the Minister make a case to the Finance Minister that that money should be coming to him and his department? Well, sorry, there aren't Barnet consequences that the block grant comes as a, a block grant is for us to spend uh, within that. And, you know, there is a myth that there was a separate set of money that was set aside by, uh, the, by Westminster for teacher pay. That is not the case. Nor indeed has, has it been, as some have, have alleged, that that money was going back uh, to Westminster. The money which, which has not gone into the, the pay rates has gone directly into school budgets, and it has gone to actually provide teachers with jobs. And that's the thing we've, we've got to realise, that if we inject additional cost into the system, that will lead to redundancies. On the flip side, if we're able to spend that money directly on schools in providing that, and not a penny has gone elsewhere, then we can actually help protect, protect those jobs. And those are the real choices, as opposed to some of the choices that, that some within the House uh, would, would have us make. I call Mr Philip Logan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And could the Minister uh, detail for the House what is a teacher's average annual salary here in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Right. Uh, inclusive of, inclusive of um, employer contributions, uh, the average teacher's salary, including em employer contributions, was 48,874 gross. Uh, the majority of teachers are above upper pay scale. Uh, upper pay scale at present, in terms of what they directly receive, is 37,870. And as I indicated, because increments are included within 1516, anybody below that scale, so we are not talking about the low paid in that regard. The low paid are actually in teaching are being protected because they are receiving increments, which means that everybody uh, below the level of 37,870 will see a pay increase for 2015-16. Uh, Catherine Seeley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. And I'm sure the Minister will join in with me in commending the sterling and invaluable work our teachers do day and daily at a time of increased pressure. Can I ask the Minister what action he has taken or is, is going to take prior to Wednesday to do all he can to avert strike action uh, and to bring the ongoing industrial action to an end? I have I've indicated that I support the call. I mean, the direct relationship in terms of the pay is between TNC and the unions. I would join, though, with the call uh, from the chair of the TNC today, urging the unions to get back around the table to look actually where we can have uh, pay settlements really for, from 17, 18 onwards to look at uh, the long term and indeed look at any of the issues that want to be brought to the table. But I'm also not going to pretend to people that there's a pot of money 
which I'm holding back, and that if only there could be agreement, I could give that pot of money. There is no more money, and that is where, unfortunately, we are in the current financial uh, circumstances. So I don't want to mislead people, but I would urge people to engage, to engage uh, around uh, the, from both the management side and the trade union side, engage seriously in addressing these issues, to get round and try and discuss that. It was a problem that previous ministers had as well, because we are in a situation that we were talking about the 15-16 settlement. There were discussions went on for 15 months without reaching an agreement, stretching over the last two jurisdictions. But I think people have got to engage and engage seriously. I call Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the minister agree with me that um, that we, we actually train too many teachers? And it's been one of the criticisms of his two predecessors that they asked for far too many teachers to be trained without the expectation of a job. So will he undertake to review that situation now that he has control of the numbers? Minister. I'm, certainly, I mean, I'm certainly happy to work with particularly the economy minister because obviously there's a, a split whenever we're talking about teacher training. There's the issue of the numbers which, which directly falls to uh, my department and also in terms of the, uh, the economy department. So I'm happy to, to look at those, those issues. There is a situation which I think the gap is not that enormous in terms of what is coming into the profession and what is being trained. And we've got to look at what the correct model, I think, is a wider work to see what the correct model in terms of sustainability in terms of, of teacher training. I'm happy to look at those issues, but I don't think that this is, that is overly directly related, to, obviously, to the current dispute, but it is obviously an important separate issue. I call Carla Lockhart. And can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? It's actually quite disappointing uh, at a time whenever I do believe staff morale uh, is low that, that we have this question before the House today uh, in such a manner. And can I thank the Minister for his efforts in, in, in assisting teachers in this role? Can the Minister actually uh, today explain to this House and dispel the myth that teachers on the mainland are actually better off than in Northern Ireland? Well, there is a, a position, there is a difference of, of position. As I said, in Scotland, in terms of, for instance, starting salaries, they will be lower than Northern Ireland, and indeed, even it works up to the maximum level in Scotland. I think, I don't know if the figures directly in front of me, but I did read them earlier. If members give me a moment, I think there is an indication within some of the uh, figures. The position in Scotland, for instance, is that uh, they reach a maximum position at the end of the, at the, end of the scale of 35,409, which is, uh, I think, approximately about 2,500 less than Northern Ireland. In England and Wales, in terms of the 1% that was, that was put in, yes, that, that would leave the, the maximum level at a higher level. However, the difference is that in Northern Ireland, in terms of the uh, wage settlement uh, for both 15, 16, because there's not been agreement to remove this, 15, 16, and 17, there is uh, pay progression in terms of an automatic increment. That was abolished in 2013 in England, which means that there is no automatic pay progression based on time served. In England, you're dependent upon a uh, particular performance, but and at the whim, if you like, of the, the Board of Governors. So there's a differential on that side of it. Um, and indeed, uh, on, the, uh, on that basis, on it, you know, there is a degree of distinction. For example, the pay deal across the board in Scotland was 2.5% over the last two years to cover the two-year period. It's 2.61% here. So I think there's a level of, of myth being put out. And again, if people are looking for parity, if, if teachers, if, sorry, if some of the unions were simply saying we will accept a 1% pay deal or we will accept a deal on that basis. On the basis of parity, the offers that they, they, they made, the initial position was in composite terms around about 8.3 per cent, which is massively different from what is there in, in the rest of the United Kingdom. So if people are going to be asking for parity, then they've also got to ask it in terms of what they demand as well. Thank you. I call Jennifer McCann. <laughs> Jennifer. Jennifer. Noted. Okay. Uh, statements. Can I ask members to take their ease while we make changes to the table? Thank you.